What's up, everybody? What's up, everybody? It's your boy, Chris. It's your boy, Chris. It's another amazing episode of Financial Patient. This channel is all about making money. It's all about saving money. It's all about building generational wealth. And it's all about financially emancipating yourself from generational poverty. On this channel, I try to give you guys a six-figure MBA level worth of investing in financial knowledge for free. And I try to give you the best podcast and interviews that we possibly can. So one of the things I always like to talk about on Financial Patient, and kind of one thing that kind of separates me from a lot of other YouTubers is that, yes, I uh, do talk about getting a college education, do talk about like first to join the Marines and things like that. But to me, there's an entire uh, market that a lot of people don't even think about going down. And I kind of have some experience in that world or whatever. I was a laborer and I actually work in the industry to some extent. And that's the blue collar world. And some of the guys that I see who go the blue collar route, I literally see the kind of uh, wealth that they build for their families. I see the fact that they don't have no student loan debt. I see uh, the kind of lifestyles they can provide for their kids. And it just kind of blows my mind that more people don't consider going the blue collar route. Um, additionally, uh, one thing else I love about blue collar, uh, no student loans, as I said earlier, you take care, it takes care of your body. And on top of that, you also, it gives you a kind of lifestyle where once you learn a trade, you are literally never unemployed. And so with that, uh, let's get started. Right now, I'm um, interviewing a, a, a fellow family member of mine, uh, Jeremy. I definitely consider you family, bro. <laughs> uh, brothers from a different mother, if you will. Uh, you, uh, you and your family, y'all gave me nothing but love. Whenever I go to Toronto, I love it up there. And uh, I'm, I'm glad to definitely have you on the podcast, man. How are you doing? How are you doing? Doing great, man. Doing excellent today. Gotcha. Just finished up a uh, work day. <laughs> I know the feeling, bro. I know the feeling, man. <laughs> yeah, it's, and it's before five o'clock right now, so I'm smiling. <laughs> Let's go for sure. All right, that's what's up. That's what's up. Before we get started, everybody, please hit that notification bell. Please like, please comment, please subscribe to the channel. All right, first off, Jeremy, like I said, I consider you family, man. I really do. Uh, I consider you as much blood as my own, as my own cousins and everything. So uh, before we get started, I want you to introduce yourself to my audience, um, to uh, my, my audience, okay? Hey guys, my name is Jeremy. I am a electrician in Toronto, Canada, um, unionized. I work every day, you know, blue collar tradesmen, whatever you want to call it. So I'm working in construction and uh, just wanted to shed some light on uh, <laughs> shed some light for you guys about um, the trades, man. And like, it's pretty good. Some Definitely. benefits about it and, uh, you know, make it a little less daunting. It's not as crazy as some people think. It's it's not as rough as it used to be, man. It's not bad. Tell me about it. Yep. So I, I remember when I was a laborer back in the day, it would be like one um, bathroom for like 50 guys. <laughs> OSHA yeah. has since then changed that. <laughs> Times have changed. <laughs> oh, Yep, times have changed. So quick thing, man. I'm hearing an accent, Jeremy. Once again, uh, tell everybody where you're from and everything. Tell everybody what great city and great country you're from. Yeah, so I'm from Canada. Uh, it's pretty good. Construction's booming out here right now. Um, my parents, they moved here from Trinidad and Tobago. They built a life here. And I kind of found my way through high school and wanted to go the uh, engineering route. Wasn't really didn't work out for me. So I found a next best, best thing I would say is trades. Uh, looked into it, got inspired from uh, one of my family members and I, I never looked back, man. I, it, within the span of six years, it's it's completely changed my life. Like I, I never, I never had a want for money or anything like that. I just got to work hard. And if you truly work hard and it, that old adage just says, you work hard for what you want, you'll get it. That's possible in the trades for sure, 100% for sure. Like any, like what, the sky's the limit. I agree, I agree. Let's uh, let's back up a little bit. You said uh, you had an interesting career path from uh, engineering to construction, because I actually did the exact opposite. Um, explain that to me. So how does, um, how, did, how, how does that work? Because most of my audience, I have a couple of Europeans and most of my audience are American. So for the Canadian uh, university system and everything, how does that work? Is it like America where we go to high school and then you go to college for four years? Ex explain that process to my listeners and everything and explain what got All you, right. how you transitioned to construction. So how it worked out for me was in <laughs> high school, we don't have, uh, I think it's SATs. We don't have that. There's just uh, college courses and university courses. I know in the States, you guys call it university college anyways, and then colleges would be called community colleges in the States. But um, yeah, so I took all university courses and tried to line myself up to go into university because that seemed like the higher education, the better thing to do. 
Uh, along the way, I did take some construction tech courses that were more applied and not necessarily college courses, but they were they were available like workshop, wood shop, different stuff like that. And uh, I kind of got exposed to it, but I didn't think at that time that it was a, a, a viable career choice. I had no idea. So I applied to uh, universities and long story short, I didn't get in to the universities. So I went to college. All right. The college for fire protection engineering led me, it led me down a path, a technical path. I started, I started to see similarities to the construction technology industry and basically the construction industry. And I was, uh, I got a little bit of guidance from my, my elders and they were trying to say, basically, if you join construction, you'll be doing all of that, that you're learning and more be qualified for more, be paid more benefits, different stuff, right? Be a much more all-rounded individual. So I'm only speaking about the electrical side. There's tons of different, different things in, in the trades, but from my path kind of led me, I, I dipped my foot in the post-secondary education system. And then I realized I'm going to be working the rest of my life. So how can I make that the most lucrative that I can? Hence, construction. So out in Canada, actually, the union I'm with is um, international. It's called UAW. the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. Yeah, the UAW, right? IBEW. Yeah, I'm sorry. And they, <laughs> they've got different right. locals. So right now, a lot of people are going to Detroit and Windsor yep. because there's a, a huge car boom plant over there that needs to be built for these electric vehicles and a bunch of other stuff. Hey, Jeremy, back up real and, quick. You said for the for that uh for, for that particular union hall, um, you said you're uh, you're part of the union. That's the IBEW, the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, correct? Correct. And there's a very large facility that right now they're building. It's uh, I believe it's in uh, is it in Michigan or where is it at? I know they're building an, an electrical uh an, an electrical car plant uh, plant and everything in um, Michigan. Is it in Michigan? Where is it located? Uh, I believe either Detroit or Windsor, one of the two, somewhere along the border, somewhere along the border, but they're definitely working together with, um, the, the union is working together, getting workers wherever they need. They need a lot of manpower and they just don't have that. So they're calling people from Ontario, all over Ontario to get in wherever they can. Right. People are going out to Ottawa. It's really, it's really booming right now. So may not always be like that, but for the foreseeable future, yes, yes. And, and what are they building and everything? Um, what, are they, what are they building in uh, Windsor and in, uh, De in Detroit, Michigan? What are they building over there? As far as I know, car plants. Car plants are being uh, outfitted right now for the production of electrical vehicles. Uh, they're trying to bring a lot more of that industry in to the North American market. So keeping all the work. I mean, they have plants in Mexico and stuff like that, but a lot of GM is huge out here. Ford is huge out here. Uh, Toyota, Honda, a lot of Honda Civics are built out here. Majority of F-150s are. Um, it's to Toyota Tacomas, yeah, man. So that all requires so much uh, electricity and a lot of different things. Not just electricians, eh? Like a bunch of people, steam fitters. Yeah, they're gonna need electricians, electric. they're gonna need plumbers, they're gonna need carpenters, drywall guys, they're gonna need HVAC guys, startup dudes, they're gonna need the whole nine, so everything. Yeah, yeah, so it's 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 big, man. Trades is uh trades is huge and you know, if you show up every day and you just go to work and you're good at your job, you get good at it. You it'll be sweaty and dusty at the end of the day, but if you kick your feet up and you'll you will you will have your, your beer or whatever and you'll yeah. you'll deserve it, you know? You'll feel like you deserved yeah. it. A beer always tastes better after you cut your own grass or shove your own snow. I don't care how you look at it. It's just, it's, it's just the way that it is. It's the way that it is. Yeah. Right, you have a little bit of experience, obviously, in the construction world. So are you more on the low voltage side, the medium voltage side, or the high voltage side with electricity, uh, Jeremy? I would say medium voltage and low voltage. So gotcha. we do everything from controls, like fine controls, dealing with like 10, 20 volts, all the way up to 6,000 volts. And beyond that, we'll probably be linesmen. Yeah. Wait, well, yeah, linesmen. Linesmen and hydro. Yeah. Those guys, uh, we, we don't bring like main services in from the city. That's the hydro guys. Yeah. So uh, nothing's uh, nothing that 
powerful as usually ever live at the time that we're working on it. So it not be. we wouldn't we wouldn't be uh we wouldn't be dealing with that. But you know, I, I, I gotta say it's pretty cool the stuff that we see and the access that we have to different different buildings. Like uh, I've been to I <laughs> I think it's the same the building in in u of t that they discovered um is it insulin or penicillin and one of those buildings the labs and stuff i'm walking through they got foil covered stuff and all these little things incubating and i'm just yeah. looking at something up in the ceiling and i'm like holy snap i can't believe i'm here right now nah, yeah it's kind of crazy nah, you can cuss man if you want to be get as good get as comfortable as possible okay yeah it's really nah, i'm all right yeah it's really interesting, Jeremy, because uh, I always say as a, on the engineering side, nothing is cooler than when I design something like on a computer or I draw it on an uh, AutoCAD, I draw it in a Revista or a BIM or anything like that. And then you have about a year of pre-construction, probably possibly, let's say two years to build it, and then probably six months to commission it. And over that, let's say four, a four year period, nothing is cooler than designing something and then physically being on a job site and watching it get built. I mean, that, I mean, I, I, how, how do you, I don't, I know how I feel about that as an engineer. How do you feel about that being on the contracting side? Uh, well, I try not to let my head get too big about it, but I feel so cool because when you're driving, let's say you're with your buddies and you're in a car, right? Yep, I know what you and mean. And you're driving down the city and you see a building and you know you can have vision like that's so raven and just be like, I know the corridors and everything yep. in that building. Yep. And the person that you're telling to wouldn't even understand. They'll just be like, "Oh, what? What does that mean? Like, you you, you know that building? You worked on it? Okay, big whoop." But it's interesting. Like, it, it really is to see that happen. Sometimes you know people think that Tim Hortons falls right out of the sky. There's just you can see it built once you have the drawings, man. It's it, and the thing is too, it's a it's a huge team effort. It's always like we over me. You know, it's never one guy it can't be one guy right so i think it, it takes a lot of it builds a lot of character working in the trades as well like i i don't know how else to say it, it it's it's a whole different animal man and there's so many different aspects like right now so I'll, i'm working high rise we're building condominium buildings so there's different stages in the sense that they they got what's the, the highest, guys what's, what's the highest condo you've built so far uh, jeremy right now i'm in the 47 story and then they got a 60 story right beside us going up yeah and so there it's a lot of work i mean some some guys could be working on uh on a building for like five years that's fine you could be you could be 25 going in starting starting a job and 30 coming out of the job so but all the time you're making you're making money man it's it's not bad at all and uh the education is if you if you go the union route at least the education is uh fully paid for you get full benefits i mean i get doctor's appointments massage therapists physio whatever i want full sunglasses prescriptions whatever shoes they, they, they take very good care of you guys in the ibw up in canada bro seriously <laughs> yeah so i mean why not you know it's, uh, people i mean it's a small price to pay for getting dirty every day, I guess. Hey, Jer Jeremy, I'll say it like this, man. I've, I've been on the forensic, I've been on the pure engineering side where I design the buildings. I've been on the forensic engineering side where I go into a building because somebody, uh, a fatality occurred because somebody messed up, whether it was the engineer, the general, you got to figure it out. And I've also been on the side as the inspector. So I've seen the entire gamut of uh, construction jobs from the being a superintendent to being a forensic uh, de uh, de uh, depositions expert to being a mechanical engineer to being uh, the liaison between the architect and the engineer and the uh, engineer of record. I'm, I'm sorry, and the uh, developer. I I've literally been on the entire gamut. I and I say this all the time. I love working in buildings that have union electricians on them because, from a mechanical standpoint, if you got good electricians, they put everything else together. They help you with your controls. They help you with your fire alarm. They help you with your computer systems, with your safety. They help you. They help you. They help me with my HVAC systems and my commissioning stuff. So a good electrician uh, is literally invaluable. And converse, if you got a trash electrician that don't know what they're doing, it's a very hard job to be on. So I, I, I fools with the unions. To me, uh, union jobs, in my opinion, and I'm not on the, I'm not on the finance side of construction. It always goes a lot smoother when you have a really really good uh, union electrician. That's just been my experience. So yeah. Yep, yep. 
I mean, we try to help everyone we can, man. You can get those extension cords running. <laughs> yeah, you, yeah, no doubt, no doubt. Yeah, uh, as far as the buildings and everything, no, I, I want to piggyback on what you said. Um, I was taking my, uh, we were dating at the time, but uh, I was taking it to this really nice restaurant uh, in uh, Miami. If you ever go to, um, if you ever go to uh, Midtown Miami, there's a there's a, uh, there's a 48 story uh, high rise called Midtown Miami, and uh, we were having dinner. I was like, hey, babe, you like that building right there? She's like, yeah, I, I like it. So I started explaining to all the stuff, and she was like. How do you know this building so well? I was like, I'm one of the engineers that built it. <laughs> it's an 82 story uh, building in downtown Miami called the Panorama, the Panorama Tower. When you go to the top of it, you can literally see like all of uh, all of South Beach. You can see all the beach, everything. It's absolutely magnificent. It's the tallest, at the time it was the tallest building um, in, um, in North America outside of Manhattan on the East Coast. Uh, stuff like that. Uh, I was I was going out of I was sailing out of a cruise out of uh, South Beach, Miami, uh, with my family, and I started pointing out to all my to my family members all the different buildings that I've worked on um, in the South Florida area. And you're right, it literally eventually got to the point people around me started watching, listening to the stories I was telling about. Yeah, we built that, we built that. Yeah, I designed that. I did depositions on that. It literally is the best feeling in the world when you build um, things that the entire world gets to see. I know for me personally, that's why I got into engineering. And I see the the, the love that uh, my fellow tradesmen have, my contractors have when they're building this stuff. And Jeremy, it literally makes the world go around. It, it truly is the best feeling in the world. It really is. You know what? I'd like to add to that. You're actually leaving behind a legacy too that, you know, uh, one of my family members built, a, his, his father built a bridge here. I think it's the Burlington Skyway. It's a pretty popular bridge. It connects the um, little, a curved part of Ontario to Niagara Falls, so you don't got to go all the way around the coast. You can just driven, shoot right over, over the water. Bridge. Yeah, yeah. So, over bridge. Every time you drive over that bridge, you just get that feeling like, wow, man, you know, my, my grandfather or my father, you know, worked on that. It's not, it's not my, it's one of my relatives, but so similar situation for you, you know, your, your, your children will, will know that, you know, their father worked on that. Well, long and long after, you know, you're just immortalized in that. It's pretty, it's pretty cool. Like it's one way to leave a legacy. I don't know. Maybe another way would be some, uh, some kind of fortune or something. Maybe you can help me out with that. I don't know. <laughs> hey man, I'm a mechanical engineer. You're a licensed electrician. We could do some damage. We'll definitely do some business together at some point in the future. Definitely. Yeah. So, you know, some investment, some investment stuff. Who knows? For sure, for sure. Yeah, pick it back off of that. If you ever go to Philly, by the way, if you ever see the Rocky Stairs, if you look downtown to Philadelphia, look to your left, you're gonna see a museum called the Barnes Art Museum. I was one of the engineers that worked on that too. So like you said, that's one of those kind of buildings that my great grandchildren will be walking through that saying, my grandfather helped design this. Well, or my great grandfather helped design this. He, he did, he was one of the commissioning agents on it. So that's the kind of stuff, like I said, Jeremy, that's why I like talking to uh, tradesmen and contractors because you guys understand it about how cool it feels building and designing stuff that the entire world gets to marvel at. And that's what I love about engineering. So yeah, that's what I love about it. That's what I love about it. Yep. Yep. All right, Jeremy, uh, Toronto is one of my favorite cities in the world, literally. Uh, I always tell my wife, if I got a job offer in TDOT, I, I probably would take it to be honest with you. I, I love Toronto. Uh, the rest of Canada is a little different, but Toronto itself is one of the coolest cities I've ever been to in my life. Toronto, Singapore, um, it's one, it's one of those kind of places that when you go to uh, Toronto, it kind of shows you what you what I hope America is going to be one day. It's a it's a beautiful city, beautiful place. Uh, for all of us, uh, for all of my Americans and my non Canadians that are listening right now, Jeremy, what are the three uh, I would say coolest things about growing up in Toronto, and growing up in Toronto, Canada? All right, uh, there's, there's nothing nothing like uh, Toronto, man. The the mixing pot. Of Toronto, it's a lot of different cultures. It's not, it's not too. Uh, I would say it's very open-minded. You could be whoever you want to be out there. Obviously, be yourself. But whoever that may be, you, you'll be accepted. You'll find a community for yourself, and uh, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. I mean, if you're if you're Caribbean like like I am, then there's no shortage of Caribbean folks. If you're like one of those, uh, not those, I should say that, but you know, if you're if you're like LGBTQ people, like they'll they'll open you with welcome arms. You know, you'll find a place there. You know, whatever it is you want to do, if you like to go around, you know, I think Toronto is very. You never get bored. You never get bored in Toronto, and not only Toronto, but the whole Greater Toronto area yeah, has yeah. like uh, this Mississauga, Brampton, uh, yep. all in the east, uh, Ajax. Ajax is a, is a is a hell of a place, man. They, they, 
in their Whitby, Pick, Pickering, all it spreads out like the, the Greater Toronto area is just can't can't get bored. You can go to Niagara Falls as well. That's one of the seven wonders of the world, wine country. So I, I, that's what I like Toronto. I, I don't think um, I don't think I'll ever get bored of of Toronto or the the Greater Toronto area, I should say. Um, another thing, as so I said, three things. Another thing is uh, for for tradesmen at least. There's a huge industry. They're always building stuff up around here. Uh, condos are going up. Houses are going up. Commercial, industrial. They're building casinos. Different, like crazy amount of stuff here, man. So they never get bored. They want to. They want to take. There's a place called Ontario Place near the lake. They want to renovate that and. and through all types of craziness so there's no shortage of industry here you'll find it in any industry you'll find it in toronto um what else let's see for the third thing the third thing i would say a lot of my family is here so that's that's one thing that i like about toronto but my family is here if, if, you're, if you're not from here uh it is quite expensive i'll say that if you, if you don't have roots put down here uh damn it is really expensive right now all right so educate me because i'm the I'm, I'm the ignorant american right now is it like manhattan uh washington dc expensive or is it more like chicago uh atlanta expensive like when you say expensive there's levels to this game what do you mean by expensive? okay okay so huh it's approaching i don't know what chicago atlanta is i like i don't know i don't know i have no, i have no comparison no like uh so in DC, you can get a decent house in Washington DC. Let's say a five bedroom, um, four bath. I would say with a, a nice basement, eight hundred thousand. That's DC. Chicago, you can get that same place for about four fifty. Atlanta, no basement, same place, four hundred, four hundred k. So Toronto, what would a five bedroom, four bath? I'm sorry, five bedroom, three and a half, four bath with a nice, with a, with a really nice, tricked out basement. What, what, what would that run you in uh, Toronto? Okay. That's nothing here is less than a million Canadian. <laughs> nothing four 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 hundred. You're getting a three hundred square foot condo. All right, so Toronto is up there with Manhattan and uh, DC. All right, it's a little more expensive. All right, got you, got you. Yeah, it's it's, it's not it's not friendly. It's not very friendly out here for uh, for budget minded folks. <laughs> but I mean, you you pretty much got to be out here. Uh, yeah, man. It, so. Uh, that's a, that's one thing I wouldn't say that that was that was the third thing the third thing I was just to was family but I kind of went into one of the downsides I was that was Toronto is very expensive so you got to make sacrifices where you can you know and uh, unless you're just balling out of control but that's yeah. why we work right no nah, yeah, yeah, that's exactly why that's why we work that's why we're professionals and all that stuff I will say this as a um, minority who's been to Toronto one thing I love about CT and I kind of alluded to this earlier whenever I go to Toronto. I just don't feel the same level of um like racial animus that I do in some parts of America. There's just and I it is what it is about it. I love America. I'm an American through and through. I almost serve for this country, so I, I would defend my country and ride for it till the till I die, literally. But when I get to Toronto, particularly when I get to Canada, particularly Toronto, it's like you can literally just feel everybody mingles, everybody hangs out, everybody parties. Uh, there's a thing called caravan up there. When you go, everybody's hanging out and having fun together. I mean, literally. Canada is one of those kind of places. When I say it's where I hope America is in 50 years, to all my to all the dudes that are listening, if you get a chance to check out Toronto and you're a single man, check it out. It's like Miami, but a little more Caribbean. <laughs> so, I mean, uh, check it out. It's one of those kind of places that I love how friendly everybody is. I love how um, kind of open-minded everybody is. It's different cultures. And you just honestly don't feel like a lot of the same tensions that you do in America. It's just, it is what it is. Uh, all right. Yeah. Uh, I'll definitely second that and say that the um, the r racial animosity is not is not really there. Uh, everyone on job sites and out in public, no one's gonna look at you too funny or anything like that, man. You're you're no matter your creed or color, people are people are welcome here. Yes, yeah, so if you work hard and you treat people with dignity and respect, people they just kind of let you do your thing. They love Jamaican people out here. Everyone eats the beef patties like crazy. I don't know why. <laughs> no doubt, no doubt. 
As a Canadian and a non-American, Jeremy, what are three very noticeable differences that you notice between Toronto and America? And by the way, I'm gonna keep saying Toronto and more so than Canada, just because I have been to like upstate, so I'm probably one of the only Americans because I've, I have traveled to like upstate Saskatchewan near like the border of Alaska. I've been, I've been, I literally been that far north and everything. Oh. So when you go up there, it does feel a little bit more like uh, America. I'll leave it at that, okay? But Toronto okay. itself, for, for this podcast, I'm gonna focus specifically kind of on the GTA and Toronto and some more of the major cities, just because those are the areas I've kind of spent more time in. But as a Canadian yeah. and a non-American, Jeremy, what are three very noticeable differences that you notice between, I would say, um, my country, America, and uh, and uh, Toronto, Toronto, Canada? So, uh, some, some of the states, first thing I would say the weather, but you guys have some states up there that uh that do get cold maybe even colder than 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 toronto chicago in the summer in the winter time is absolutely no joke neither is minneapolis <laughs> yes so those places might be icy as well but uh up here you gotta be gotta be uh kind of willing to tough out the elements get you know you gotta have no matter if you're working indoors or outdoors or traveling to work whatever it may be that's one thing about canada there's no there's no uh Hunky dory all summer season. You guys don't no, have Miami, I take it. You guys don't have, Miami, have you don't have Miami or Los Angeles, I take it. We don't have no like warm place here in the in the winter. I'm sorry. So you gotta be prepared for a winter. That's one thing. That's one thing uh Toronto it, is different about Toronto. Another thing is Toronto is very busy actually. Uh yeah, we're very, very busy. Some people compare the uh Toronto traffic to LA traffic and um yeah, I agree with that it, it may there's a there's a saying out here that uh Toronto is one hour away from Toronto so I'll let you think about that that's uh <laughs> um yeah so it's really really busy man and it's only getting busier there's a huge housing boom here and, and population boom as well I don't I don't know I don't know how it's going to be sustainable in the future, but it's happening. So, and we can see it before our eyes every day. Every day, it gets busier and busier. Like I'm building condominiums right now in a populated area, so population's going up. People are li literally living in the sky now instead of spread out, but still four lanes on the road. So, what <laughs> what you going to do, right? right? It's good for business, I would say that. It's good for businesses. They're gonna be uh, seeing a lot more traffic, which is it's as good as well. So, uh, hmm. the third thing. What's the difference you say between America and uh, Canada? One thing yeah, I noticed about Canadians, you guys are a lot friendlier than we are. Like it's just, and I and I'm, I'm always kind of curious why that is, but I find in Canada everybody's like a lot friendlier and nicer, and people just a lot less aggressive. It's it's it's, it's like such a weird thing. Like leaving New York and going to Toronto or leaving Philly or Baltimore and then going to Toronto for a weekend. It's literally night and day. <laughs> okay, yeah. So that's that's true. Uh, you won't get, you won't tend to be harassed at many places. Like robberies still do happen at gas stations. If you, if you're not street smart, you could still get something, something bad to happen. But I would say it's much less uh, harassment in the public and stuff. People, there are crazy people everywhere, but uh, you know, if you're if you're a young professional woman or something and you go to a mcdonald's you're not gonna have a bunch of hooligans people usually have more broad up seat well i wouldn't say broad up seat because i don't know what where they're coming from but uh no one's no one's like harassing you for about much downtown toronto certain pockets certain places there are some um i'll say people experiencing some hard times and uh they're a little bit crazy I, i've been I've almost gotten to a, gotten in a fight with a bum before who was drinking uh, isopropyl alcohol, and then uh, a paramedic came, kind of got in between it. But you know, you got to be able to uh, definitely defend yourself out here in Toronto. That's all I could say. We don't have like it's not no open carry state or anything like that. So, got to know a little something. And best thing to do is just be street smart out here. But you don't come into the amount of uh, you know. I, I haven't been to the to the states to say anything about them really, I but have, I have. I've lived in four murder capitals. Whenever I'm in Toronto, very rarely does, does my um street does like my street senses or my street smarts start popping off. Like Toronto, I don't really got to worry about like for instance mass shootings when I'm up there. Um, I don't really got to worry about some dudes like trying to steal my car. It's it, like it's such a 
it's such an interesting but cool uh, metro uh, major major urban market just because of how it looks like for instance Chicago it looks like New York it looks like Manhattan and the people to some extent look like Miami but it just feels so much different um, and that, that's something that I kind of love about Toronto it's just such a it's such a unique um, part of, of, of the world and like I said that's kind of where I hope America is going eventually like I said when I'm in Southeast Baltimore or Southeast DC or um, or uh, Liberty City, Miami, it's a very different vibe than uh, what I feel like when I'm in, Miami, when I'm in uh, Toronto. So it is what it is. <laughs> yep. Let's keep it moving, Jeremy. We can talk all day about TDOT and uh, all the uh, beautiful things about it. But uh, I've always worked around blue collar dudes. You know that. Um, I was a laborer in college. I actually broke concrete one summer. Um, I've worked on forensics. I've worked as a superintendent. I've worked on the deposition side, like I said a little bit earlier. Um, you kind of touched a little bit on it earlier, but what was your... Um, what made you want to be an electrician? I know you said I know you had some family members that were kind of in the trades. At least I believe that you do. But what what made you want to be an actual elect electrician? I would say. All right. First thing, I always was amazed by lightning and stuff like that. Sounds corny, but I like I like lightning and thunder and things like that. So I was like, oh, you know, what's this about? Voltage, electricity, stuck my finger in a lamp socket before, tripped the breaker. What's going on with that? You know, trying to figure it out. And uh, that's when I was younger, low boy stuff. So now, fast forward into high school, going through school, thinking about what I want to do. I wanted to, I was thinking, uh, oh, you know, maybe I want to be a fireman or something, something in the service emergency services, firemen, yeah, you know, you get a little bit of uh, clout, ladies love you, that kind of stuff. So I looked into it and I said, well, you know, I don't know if uh, I can I can throw somebody over my shoulders and run up the stairs and all that. So let me, uh, let me try to help myself. Maybe I'll do fire protection engineering and, and learn about the systems inside, right? So, because I was a bit more of a technical person. I still am. And um, so I went into that, the, basically learning about fire alarm systems and sprinkler systems. And at a family gathering, sat down. One of my uncles talked to me about what I was doing. He's like, hey, man, you know, do electrical. Um, you get to do all that and more. Yep. It's such a broader scale. You, you're going to be so much, so much more skilled if you do electrical. So try it out. So. My career path was I ended up applying to the union. I got in on the first try, went through a couple interview processes and an aptitude test and got into an apprenticeship. So the apprenticeship side now is basically your induction into whichever trade you choose. It doesn't have to be just electrical. Got to learn basic stuff. First, you start off doing menial tasks, maybe counting some screws or something in a corner. Right, but then they give you more and more responsibility and everything is by hours. So as you accumulate your hours, you accumulate a different level. Now, you can get paid for each and every one of those hours because you're working, you're actively full-time employed. After a certain amount of time, you gotta go to college, like I guess you would say community college or a technical college, right. skilled trades college. And that is all paid for and you get to learn a bit more about your trade. Funny thing is, I'll give you an example. I was working on um, motors and like squirrel cage motors and stuff, VFDs, variable frequency drives. Yep, yep. These things are controllers for, for, for larger motors yep. to prevent damage and, and just give you finer control of, of how a motor would work. So basically, uh, I was working on those and trying to learn on the job, which is part of it. And then I got my phone call and uh, email basically saying, all right, it's time for you to go to school. And in six weeks, you got to go to school. Here, here, this is everything, you know, student number, go get your student card, et cetera, et cetera. That whole eight weeks I was in college, because it's only eight week blocks. It's not that bad, actually. Eight, eight weeks in college, I was learning about everything I was doing for the past nine months. But actually learning about it, like from the book and doing labs, yep. getting instruction about it, which is, it was hilarious to me. It was just a timing thing, but 
I actually felt like, oh man, I have so many moments where I was like, oh, oh this is what this is about. But I'm trying to uh, looking looking through the manual, seeing what's what when I was on out in the field. So it's it's it really it's really enlightening, I would say. Electrical. I don't know about the other the HVAC as well. Plumbing. You learn different different things in the school because they have in the college. You're you're working around and with everyone. You know, you see in the cafeteria, people got tests and stuff. So you got you gotta you gotta do your exam. There's three levels of schooling, but there's five levels of apprenticeship. Right. And after all of that, there's a certification of qualifications. I don't know how it works in the states, but that's how it is in Canada. Then you you write that, and you're a fully qualified electrician in your trade. You can become a master electrician out in Canada. They changed it to you're able to own a business if you have a one master electrician. So then you can have your own practice, like your own business. I wouldn't say practice, your own business, and uh, you know, sky's the limit from there, man. As hard as you want to work, there's work out there for you. Recently, got some information that uh, in Edmonton and uh, Calgary, there's you basically you can demand your price you, how much you want like if you if you put up uh, an ad on facebook marketplace you can take as much work as you want and and make <laughs> make a year's salary in in a matter of months and then just kick back for the rest of the year if that's what you want to do or you could just keep going and like i said the sky's the limit so it's pretty good man I, me myself i like to I, I take it easy i don't i don't go too hard because you know uh body is a is a finite thing you know so got to take care of yourself too as well that's a big thing got to do those stretches those water rotator cuff exercises yeah, you've got to be fit if you're working in the trades um yeah, you could be a slob or whatever you want or out of shape but you'll, you'll feel it you'll definitely feel it so it pays to be in shape definitely definitely you said a lot, Jeremy. I, I want to kind of um, delve into. Uh, first off, uh, you said schooling and everything. They sent you to school. They said you get more education. You need to go to a, we would call it a community college or trade school. School, school, school. So tell me this to, to all my listeners: How much student loan debt did you get to become um, uh, to go into trades and become an electrician? How much student loan debt do you have? Zero. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> Nothing at all. I didn't take any debt, and. Uh, if, if even if let's say you're coming from like a hard situation they'll help you out man they'll help you out if you don't have a car you could get transit uh like a transit card if you if you need help for tools you could get that it's it's really they need trades people that's all i can say man there's high demand high demand when let me put it to you like this also when covid 19 in 2019 was happening all these industries shut down people were like i don't know what, what people were doing to survive but it wasn't me it wasn't the tradesmen working next to me we were working we were making our our money and you know showing up to work we had to wear our masks There's all these different protocols but we were essential workers so that is one thing that you can take into account as well that. So you got to think about these things as well if you're if you're if you're trying to make it out here as an adult. Yep, I agree. I agree. So let me ask you this: in America, for the most part, they do teach you. They do pay you essentially to go to trade school and everything um, at night. Do they do that uh, in Canada as well? Do they basically pay you to go to college uh, to learn your trade in uh, Canada as well? You will basically be you'll be getting like a student. Uh, I wouldn't say loan really. I would say more like a benefit. My living yeah. expenses. So when you're not working, you basically apply for something called employment insurance. So when you're on that, now they give you a specific code that you put in and that lets the government know, okay, you're not unemployed. You're just getting skilled training. And the union comes in and says, all right, every time you get an employment insurance payment, you're going to be getting a benefit as well. So the, the, they'll also, I, they'll match it or something or something or the other. They'll give you a certain amount so you can survive through schooling. You should have savings, of course, and budget for all that, but you'll still be making an income. And it's, it's pretty nice, like makes 
school way less stressful. Like, I can't imagine having to study for exams and all that stuff and thinking about, I got $10,000 I got to pay back at the end of this. Are you crazy? I would not. Well, you, be... you, Canadian, you Canadians are lucky because almost all of us Americans go through that. <laughs> yeah, like, that's, I, I mean, I'm sure a lot of university students out here, university is pretty expensive uh, from what I hear. So, <laughs> it's... Yeah, in America, uh, in-state college, the average in-state college is $105,000 right now. The average out-of-state college is like one thirty-five. So, yeah, a lot of people go to college for four years in America, and they'll come out with uh, $100,000 of the student loan debt, and I have a job that pays them $42,000 a year. That's, the, uh, that's, that's a horrible, unfortunate reality. That was not necessarily my case. I went to undergrad for free. Thank you, God. Um, I did I did get screwed over and had to pay for my master's degree, which truly sucked, but it is what it is. It's paid off now. But uh, one thing I always tell people, tell my listeners that are listening, if you could learn a trade, they don't you, don't, you don't, you don't get any student loans. They pay you to go to college. And not only do they pay you to go to college, just off of what Jeremy is telling me, though, I know the IBEW does it. I know, uh, I know my pipe fitter unions do it. I know my, uh, my steam fitters and my uh, commissioning guys do it. Once you learn that trade and they see you're actually about your books and you're about your business, they literally find work for you. So unlike, say, college, where in America, where you have to go out and um, get a bunch of student loans uh, for the most part, um, unless you're lucky, you know, unless you're smart enough to get scholarships and go, uh, get a full ride and go that route. In America, for the most part, you have to get student loans or you have to come out with some type of student loan debt in regards to uh, paying for college. And then you have to find a, and then you have to find your career. If you learn a trade, they pay you to go to college and then the salaries that you get are insane. So like what Jeremy was talking about right now, they're having a huge uh, they're having an, they're, they're having a huge uh, backlog of work and everything and they want electricians to go to different parts of Canada. I've worked with electricians and steam fitters and commissioning dudes in America who will spend like six months working in New York during the summertime and then they'll fly down to Miami <laughs> and uh, during the winter work for another six months and they make literally a half a million dollars in New York and half a million dollars in Miami, a million dollars. I've met electricians and elevator operators who make that kind of money. I met uh, pipe fitters who kind of travel across the country doing that kind of stuff. So that's why I say to me, trades are one of those, it's like an undiscovered country. So many people are making money off of it and you don't walk away with any student loan debt. And that's what I love. That's that's what I, that's one reason why I wanted to have this conversation with a, a blue collar professional, because Jeremy, you're living that world right now. And so many of my listeners don't know anything about it. They think go to college, get a bunch of student loan debt, get a job. And then that's life. Whereas you're doing it the exact opposite. You got the job, you have no student loan debt, and now you're stacking paper. I love it. I love it. Yeah, man. Peace of mind is a uh, is, is a huge thing. I, I wouldn't I wouldn't want to put myself in a hole and like then spend ten years of my life trying to get out of it. It's uh, you know you it's really rewarding to be able to you know <laughs> I guess. I don't have a family yet. I'm not a father or anything, but, uh, you know, you could be a pretty good provider if you're, uh, if you're a tradesman. So that's one thing. If anyone has children or anything like that, it's, uh, it's a good way to make a living. That's for sure. Yeah. So I wanted to, uh, also let you know, like a day in the life of a tradesman, cause it's not all sunshine and roses. Well, yeah. Yeah. Tell, tell, tell me about that. Cause I, I know how, how hard you guys work. So tell them my listeners, what's it like being a, what is a typical day for Jeremy, the electrician? Tell me about it. So you usually you got to be in bed, let's say at like 8 to 9 p.m. Got to get a good sleep, plenty of sleep. If you don't get a lot of sleep, performance goes down and you're basically like a high performance machine. So you got to make sure that, you know, everything's going to be working in the morning. So you wake up, say, depending on your commute, uh, 4 a.m. Some people are hitting the road as early as 4.30. They're a little too far away. So you got to go where the work is. Let's say you wake up 4 a.m., get your breakfast in, do a little morning warm-up routine, out the door by 5, 5.30 a.m. And work usually starts around 6.37. Some places like to start earlier. So you're going to be working basically start off the day it starts off slow you check in get your briefing from your foreman or if you already know where you're doing report to where you're at you got your tools with you so tradesmen like to have their tools but some people are like uh that's a whole nother thing tools are like if you go to a tool store you're like a kid in a candy store for some guys but anyways you gotta have your tools have your tools with you uh you get to work, man. And, you know, people like to put their Bluetooth uh, stereo on. You'll be putting in plugs. Some days you'll be putting in pipe. 
installing a conduit. So conduit is just a pipe that you run wires through and you got to bend it, know certain angles, some basic math, addition, subtraction, multiplication, you know, all that you're good. Um, there's more complicated formulas when you get into more technical stuff. Usually the foreman will have those already figured out for you, but if you got to do it on the fly, it's good to know. And uh, nowadays everyone has a code book on, the, on a PDF, so if you got to make a quick reference, so that's not, that's not a bad thing. Usually that stuff is all figured out though already, so you just got to put in the work. Installers is usually what they call us. So you're doing that at 9, 9 o'clock, everyone likes to have coffee. Uh, you get back to work at 9 15 9 20 and normal lunch time 12 o'clock then you're out of there by like three o'clock let's say and you could be home you could be home as early as four o'clock sometimes so i mean it's not that bad you got a, a lot of the rest of the day for you and uh the main thing is you take care of yourself and you eat a good lunch have a good breakfast get good sleep then you can make the most of the rest of your day. Some days you come home and you're tired and it doesn't matter how early you got off work, but you've been putting in work. So you, you get home, you're just super tired and drained. So that does take a toll on you. But I mean, sometimes it's overtime as well. And you just gotta work and go through it the whole time. It's not bad, man. It's not bad at all. Working weekends, sometimes you gotta make a sacrifice. Let's say you got a plan made on the weekend and then your boss says on Friday, hey, we're doing a shutdown or something. We got coming for 3 a.m. I mean, I wouldn't sit. There's been times when I said, hey, I got to cancel everything this weekend. I'm not showing up. I'm sorry. I got to go work. That's it. So it's a sacrifice, but it gets right. Is, is she understanding when you say, baby, I got to work on a Saturday or a Sunday? Is she understanding? Is she cool with it? Yeah, for sure. For sure. That's what it's about. Like if you're if you're if you're a working person and you're a hustler, you're, you know, you might as well like just make some money, right? Absolutely. I, I know. Anyways, yeah. So, uh, a lot of times you're gonna get, you drill in something in the ceiling and get it dust in your face. It's not glamorous at all. This beard gets all matted up when we get the drywallers and the sanders in there, Ooh, yes. and their compound dust gets in there. You go to wash your face; it actually makes it more hard. Yep. So it's it's not it's not a nice feeling, breathing in a lot of dust. There are some workplace hazards, uh, sharp things. Sometimes you just get a nice slash across your arm from a, a steel stud. It doesn't feel nice, but it happens. Uh, you could be as careful as you want, but things will always happen, right? So uh you could lose a finger you know <laughs> that's the thing it's not it's not it's not uh, all sunshine and roses but it's all good man like it's, you, you just gotta this workplace hazard you could get you get a pain from sitting in a chair for too long as well you gotta think about it like that that's how i look at it we get boots that have orthotics so you know that's why it, it pays to take good care of yourself and get a lot of sleep you gotta be alert you gotta make sure even if you can't lift something heavy there's always someone there to help you they don't put you in a situation unless your boss is a real they don't they wouldn't put you in a situation where you could hurt yourself because that's ultimately hurting the company costing them money so you you, you got to be a little uh let's i would say assertive as well when you're uh when you're a tradesman and uh, as far as electrical goes, uh, one thing that's unique about electrical is we install our work, but we're one of the only trades to fill our work with wire and that kind of thing. Uh, like a plumber installed pipes. Yeah. That's it. They put the pipe in, it's done. HVAC, what's going in the air, right? So there's almost twice as much work as an electrician out there. You got to pull your feeders and everything. Exactly. Yep. What's you guys' lead? Time? Just off the cuff. What's you guys' lead time right now for like a twenty four hundred amp switchboard, like a, a, a large piece of switch gear? What's your lead time right now in Canada? In America, it's like a, a year right now. What is it like right now in Toronto? Okay, on that side of things, I, I don't see that side of things. The ordering, but uh, I will say a few years ago we had shortage of material, and some people like you show up to work, material would be finished, and you'd just be hanging out trying to find a little bit of busy work. So like. A panel and stuff like that that would probably be ordered at the beginning of the job sometimes sometimes it's custom made I'm, most sure. times it's probably custom made right right and uh there's all types of blunders and stuff that happens like let's say they order the wrong material yeah. and it's <laughs> like you're the electrician 
you're looking at it like something's something's not right here like you call your foreman over and he's like oh like this is the wrong thing and you know it's, it's just it's like that sometimes and it, there's uh there's a lot of delays but most of the time the foreman knows what what's good that's what makes a good foreman right like if you have a good boss it shouldn't be anything to worry about once you work hard yeah he should if you have a good foreman he should be the one to call uh, uh us in the construction management world and be like look we have a problem with this this is what the specs are saying this is what the submittal package is saying uh it's not working so we need you to write an rfi this is what we this is what we have on site this is what we should have if you have a good foreman they're very on top of that kind of stuff if you have a good construction manager they're basically there with you when you guys are um doing the stuff say okay wait a minute this isn't correct we need a i don't know a 10 amp breaker this is a 15 amp breaker there's a problem with it so if you have a good if you have a good crew this is the kind of stuff that they should be catching uh hopefully early enough so it doesn't delay the job yeah uh, another thing about well material like the lead times and stuff like that the um the screws that we used to get during COVID times, I think they were they reduced the quality of the of the production and the, or I guess the tolerances of their machining. And for a long while, like maybe about a year or so period, the, the screws were never fitting properly to the uh, screwdriver head. Robertson yeah, screws. I don't know if you guys use the Robertson out there, but uh, yeah, Robertson head screws, square head screws. Man, it was it was a nightmare. You'd be it, it was really bad. It was really bad during the uh, supply chain delays. So we felt it on, on uh, a lot of different aspects, maybe down to the screws, down to the coils of wire. Now, I, 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 I believe you. I remember I got an opportunity, well, I was shortlisted to get an opportunity to help build a data center in Toronto. I don't know where it was at or what particular data center was gonna be. I just know it was gonna be one for either Amazon, Facebook, or Microsoft. I don't know who it was gonna be for or where, but my name got shortlisted on it. Ultimately, someone else was one that ended up being sent to Toronto. I wanted to go because as an American, the amount of money you make when you cross that border, it is insane. <laughs> so they pay your living expenses, you get a per diem, it is ridiculous. So I wanted to be on that job. But what was crazy was at the time, our lead times in America were like a year for our switchboards, but for Toronto at the point, it was only like one month. So I, I don't know what was going on or what, but I was just like, wow. So not only were they had paid me more, it probably been a more efficient job because you guys, I guess, had the material. I don't know. Now I heard it's kind of reversed. Um, in America, it's still a year. I don't know what it is in Toronto, but I've heard now that you guys are lead time are really bad. So I guess it's caught with the rest of the world. Let me ask you this, Jeremy. Uh, you familiar with the uh, Fatal Four? <laughs> what do you mean? Got you. So as an electrician, obviously I have mad love for the uh, contracting world, but uh, being that I have been on job sites, I have seen some uh, pretty horrible uh, injuries. I'll say it. I'll say it that way. So uh, in the contracting world, there is an element, and you kind of got done talking about it. That there is a slight element of danger. I actually had somebody to shoot me a, a message on my phone about it. About is being a construction worker dangerous? And I know one aspect about uh, construction is yes, there are OSHA standards. Um, there are different things that happen. And for instance, one aspect of that is a fatal four. What that means is that um, electrocutions, uh, fall, falls, struck by, and caught in between are the four leading causes of deaths on a job site. And I don't know what it is in, in Canada, but in America, every day, at least one electrician dies on a job site, unfortunately. Not to be too morbid, but these are just the actual stats. And around 20 electricians um, get injured, um, depending on what part of the country you're in. So having said that, what do you do, Jeremy, as an electrician, as a licensed electrician, what do you do to protect yourself and to um, be safe on a job site? Because in America, it's actually more dangerous to be an electrician than, than to be a police officer. So what do you do to, what do you do to protect yourself, I would say? All right. First of all, I always wear my PPE, man. People think it's cool not to wear a hard hat and whatnot. Uh, it's not cool Great. to get hit really hard. And uh, I'll tell you, if you bump your head on some of those like uh, those steel pipes, man, they're not budging, man. They're not budging. You really find out how soft you are when uh, when you bang your head on one of those things. But uh, hard hat, gloves, all those PPE things I wear, I always make sure to protect my hair with. Uh, Airplugs and stuff. There's a lot of loud noises going on in the job site. Uh, <laughs> yeah, always wearing PPE. That's one thing. Another thing is uh, stretching and doing stretches while I'm waiting for a hoist or something like that. I always or an elevator. I always do my stretches and uh, make sure to stay warmed up. And I mean, as much as I can, right? Don't want to don't want to be too goofy about it, but gotta be gotta be limber. Coming down, stepping down from a ladder. Something as 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 uh simplest coming down from a ladder and missing a step that could pretty much end your day 
uh, trip, trip hazards, fall hazards, always got to be alert. I never really walk in, uh, walking and walking and being on the cell phone. It's not really a good thing to do. Uh, also, like cleaning and not being a slob and keeping material and stuff all around is, is it could be dangerous. That's this organization and stuff like that is a real big part of being a, a good electrician. It makes the workflow easier. Also, increases the safety. People don't really realize that, but it really does. So yeah, that's uh, that's all I really have to say about that. Because a lot of a lot of the safety. We got people like safety guys that come on site and point out hazards. Um, there are things that you could be ticketed for if you're if you're not doing if you're not wearing certain harnesses or PPE. Uh, people can get tickets. Well, I think the worker gets like a five hundred dollar ticket. Nope, the worker gets fifty dollar ticket if you're not wearing a harness or tied off or something like that. The employer will get uh, the foreman will get a five hundred dollar ticket and the employer will get a five thousand dollar ticket. So I, I don't know how often that really happens, right. but it can happen. So they have they have things in place. Conse there are consequences. I'll say that for for not being safe. Got you, got you. You guys have OSHA in Canada, right? OSH, OS Occupational Safety Health, uh, Hazard Association. Do you guys have that in Canada? Yep. Got you. And I'm assuming like your foreman and even probably some of you guys as your uh, as electricians, you guys probably have to be like OSHA 10 certified, OSHA 30 certified, things like that. I'm not sure about that. There, there are people that always got to be like a CPR person on site and uh, different, different uh, safety reps. Like somebody has to be an elected safety rep on, on the site. Got you. Got you. All right. Cool. Cool. All right. Let's go to a slightly more positive, uh, positive subject. I don't want to talk about electric electrocutions and things like that or fatalities I've seen on job sites. It's never, it's never, those are the kind of things I want to forget to be honest with you, but, uh, this is a finance channel, Jeremy. And, uh, earlier we kind of talked a little bit about, uh, just as a electrician, as a tradesman, you've been, you're blessed in regards to, uh, salaries and things of that nature from a salary standpoint, Jeremy, how does a salary of say like, a licensed electrician who has a couple years in the game how does your how does five years of experience as a licensed electrician compare to a person who graduated from college last year in canada and they have one year of experience because they have four years of college and then one year of experience how does your salary how would your salary compare to a person who has a four-year degree i don't know it's like psychology from the university of toronto oh um so if you're fortunate enough to come out of that psychology degree and get a job uh that pays you about eighty thousand dollars a year, then you'll be close to what an electrician is making. So that's that's uh, electricians. They, each year they get paid more and more. And hold on, Jeremy. Do psychologists in Canada and Toronto make eighty thousand dollars a year with a bachelor's degree? In America, they don't. I don't know what they. I don't know what they do for work, really. Um, but I, I, I maybe uh, like a position when a company or something. I, I really don't know what they what they would do to do to make to be making that kind of money, but uh, yeah, like tradesmen after they're done, they're pretty much coming out close to six figures, if not already beyond that, depending on how much work you do during the year. Like uh, you could do you could do probably a uh, licensed electrician could probably do 150 in a year. I mean, you you gave an example there that. Uh, doesn't seem too far fetched. It just depends on the type of work you're doing. Yep. I've seen it, Jeremy, in so many different venues and things like that where a guy literally he'll work like in let's say Boston in the summertime. Because Boston in the summertime is actually a pretty nice city. Or they're working like say uh Minneapolis in the summertime, which in the summertime is not the bad city. And then when it gets freezing, they'll go to like Arizona or they'll go to like Los Angeles or they'll go to like Miami in the in the winter and literally double their salary what they were making up in uh, in Boston or in Minneapolis. So if you're making 100 k 150 k in um, New York, you can go to another part of the country when New York is freezing or when Toronto is freezing and then basically get a job somewhere else. And that to me is the reason why. And then on top of that, Jeremy, you said that uh, a six, you said that you're making six, um, a good electrician is making six figures easy after a couple years of uh, being in the trade. That also people, I want to keep this, I want, I want, I want to hammer this home. This is a person who does not have any student loan debt. <laughs> so not only are you making the six figures, you don't got to pay back Sally Mae or, or Freddie Mac or any of the people. Yeah, like, I, I don't know what it feels like to have uh, student loan debt. It, I, it probably doesn't feel good, man. It sucks. 
Francisco. So I, I, paid, I paid for my master's degree and my company at the time told me they would basically pay me a very large percentage of it. I got about 90% done with the program. They told me, sorry, Chris, we're not gonna pay you back for it. So I ended up walking away, basically owning about $100,000 with my master's degree. Now I was blessed and I was fortunate because uh, I am as a mechanical engineer, I, I make I make I do pretty well for myself. But yeah, I live in the hood and I had roommates for a little bit. So imagine that you got a master's degree, you're in your late twenties and you live in the hood and you got a roommate. <laughs> that was my life for a little bit. Having said that, Sally Mae has gone out of my life. I ate tuna fish and uh, Kool Aid and it's done, so I'm good. But yeah, if, if you're if you learn a trade in all seriousness, that's not the lifestyle you get to live, at least not in America. So people, I I always say this. Uh, college has its place. I'm a mechanical engineer, I have an MBA. College has its place. But listen to what this young man right here is telling you because the guys that I see on a day-to-day -day basis who are doing the blue collar, this is the sheet metal workers, the masons, the carpenters, um, they don't got student loans. Their money is very good. Another question I wanna ask you, this is Jeremy, from an unemployment standpoint, uh, what are the unemployment numbers like for a uh, licensed electrician in, in uh, Toronto, Canada? Like, um, are you guys struggling to find jobs, if you will? Uh, not really, man. Not really. I, I would say it's it's the exact opposite. They need more people. They need more people than they can get. Like the I, I don't know. I can't talk percentages about unemployment rate. Uh, let's say let's just throw out well, one percent, like maybe one percent, and that's probably because the person doesn't want to work. Mm -hmm. So you could you could pretty much you could pretty much stay employed if you find side work as well. Anything anything really uh that can be transferred into a residential uh setting so plumbing uh hvac as well those kinds of things you can also transfer into the residential side and find work if you need to uh right now i, I don't know if i specified but i'm more of a commercial industrial electrician right now i'm working on condominiums so i had the option to kind of move around a bit and and change what i was change up what i was doing i i've worked in schools i've worked at the uh the rogers center sky dome uh for the the blue jays renovation uh worked in the cn tower built the new observation deck or was involved in it i should say so now i'm just building condos man i'm putting in stove plugs dryers whatever whatever electrical uh amenities they need and it's, it's not bad man it's just a day's work so uh in terms of unemployment like if you're in the union they usually have a lot of nice jobs for you because uh you get you basically you're getting the, your pick of your pick of the crop in terms of jobs they give you some pretty nice high profile jobs you also can work for smaller companies that are unionized and uh for some people they like that you might get a truck or something you just go around and uh fix you know, put up grandma's vanity lights or something, and uh, it's not bad. It's not bad at all. Uh, yeah. Let me ask you this, Jeremy. I did a job in Chicago. It was so cold, and the, the project was kind of between two very large buildings, so it was kind of like a wind tunnel where we were working. And it was so cold, we literally were, like walked inside of a commercial freezer to get warm. That's how cold it was. I saw it's like a wind chill, like with a wind chill like negative forty. Toronto gets very cold as well. So like, how do you deal with like working outside? Uh, somebody just shot me a text about that. How do you deal with like working outside and freezing Toronto in December or February, uh, <laughs> being an electrician? How, how do you deal with that? Well, when you work, you work outside, man, you just, you just gotta face the elements, you know, make sure you moisturize, drink lots of water. Um, they got propane heaters usually for people. If you're working indoors, you, you don't gotta worry. Just go into a parking garage and go to your job. If you're working outdoors, like let's say these condominiums, they may not have the windows up, yeah. uh, the windows in yet. So that's the case. You'll be getting some fierce winds. Uh, you just kind of kind of motivates you to get, work a little faster. Sometimes you can't feel your hands or your fine motor controls. You lose them, right. and that's all part of it, man. It's it's really tough. It's that's a tough part of it. Uh, <laughs> this you just gotta tough it out. That's, that's that's all there is. Yeah. Do you do the uh the hand the, um, the the heated gloves or do you do like the uh, the, the the what do you call it, the, the heated hand things or do you do the heated gloves or not not really? Not really. You just if you stay moving if you're always doing something with your hands the blood will stay there. And so when you stop working or if you're standing around you can't be standing around. Yeah. That's the that's when it gets hard. They used to tell us if you're cold it's because you're not swinging the hammer hard enough. That's what they, that's what they used to tell us. 
<laughs> yeah, well, I mean, the, everything changes when it's cold too. The materials that we work with, their properties change a little bit. So uh, we're using something called flexible pour line right now. It gets harder to cut. We've got um, vinyl rubber tape, vinyl tape uh, right. that becomes almost useless. And uh, we've got soap as a like looks like yellow custard. That stuff freezes, doesn't become much. Uh, it kind of loses its uh, viscosity properties. Yeah, yeah, man. Well, yeah. So all types of different factors, but you know, you just got to keep keep doing, keep going, just work it, work it out. Definitely. So I just got a question, Jeremy, for one of my subscribers. I want to ask this one. It hits a little close to home, but I think you'd, you'd be a good guy to answer it. Jeremy, I live in Chicago and I'm considering joining a union. I've enjoyed this channel and this chat. When I drive by construction sites, though, I don't see a lot of minorities or people of color. Have you ever experienced any racism in construction? And are there a lot of people of color in construction? Because I don't see a lot here in America. Oh, OK. Um, so out here in Toronto, man, there's like <laughs> I work right now. I, uh, another guy joined our crew named Trevor is a old Jamaican fellow. I'm working with a Jamaican guy, working with three white guys, four white guys, and they're not even considered, uh, they're, they're not like your, uh, they're Caucasian, but they're more European. So like a Croatian dude, two Italian dudes, a Portuguese dude. So they're all kind of like immigrant as well. And uh, no one's really like, no one's really uh, prejudiced, you know, it's it's, it's pretty, uh, they don't really tolerate that out, out here, I would say. On the job site, you can get pretty much uh, booted for for your for being disrespectful like that um i see a lot of uh out here in toronto at least there's a lot of colored people working on on the job sites uh, a lot of any every single creed and color man you could find will be working out here on these job sites man because it's it's where it's where it's at right now i mean it's pretty good pretty good getting so definitely what I'll tell this guy as well, um, yes, I'll be honest with you, I have experienced my fair share of racism on construction sites, but I've also experienced my fair share of racism at church. I've experienced my fair share of racism in engineering, um, to be honest with you. So it is what it is. Uh, I can't speak for Canada because I am not Canadian, I'm an American. But I will tell you this, bro. Um, if you, you, your idea when you get to corporate America, this is whether you want to go the electrician route, you want to go the engineering route like I went, you got to get so good at what you do that even the racist people can't stop you. That's the advice that I'll give you. Get your certifications. Uh, Jeremy, you talked about uh, becoming a master electrician. Uh, me, I, I myself want to become a professional engineer one day. Uh, I have multiple certifications in LEED. I have multiple certifications as far as being a certified mechanical inspector. I have multiple certifications as far as having an MBA. I have multiple certifications in finance and construction and engineering, the whole nine. You got to get so good at what you do that the haters can't stop you. Um, even if they don't like you, they got to basically say, okay, I don't like that guy, but he works hard. He's very smart. And this dude, whatever I put him on, whatever task I assign him to, he's the best in the company at doing it. If you approach it like that, even if a racist person uh, doesn't let you on their crew or doesn't let you in their um, in their company, another person who's not racist is going to realize your grind and see how smart you are and see how, how hard you work. And they're going to give you a shot. And that racist moron is going to have, is going to be working for you one day. I have seen that in my own career. So don't let these, don't, don't let a person who doesn't like you because of your religion, your color, your skin or whatever, or what country you're from, uh, stop you from uh, achieving your dreams. That's how, how that's how I'll answer that question. Is anything you want to add to that, Jeremy? Yeah. Also, if there's any uh, women listening to this, uh, females have uh, a really good stake in the trades. So, I mean, if you're a female and you think you can, you can uh, get done, you can make a really good living there. You can make uh, make a lot of money, man. You could be in the upper the upper earning pool for sure. And with all those benefits and pension and all that, all that good stuff, you guys get your own representative as well. Get to wear pink hard hats if you want. I mean, whatever you want. They have, they have a whole, a whole crew, a whole group for you guys too in the union. It's, it's really cool. Yeah, and from my experience of uh, working with uh, females in the industry and in the field, um, I find it depending on the female, guys will work harder for a woman than they will for a man. Uh, it's kind of interesting if a woman knows how to um i'm not even saying it has to be anything sexual or whatever but just in general men like being around women who make them feel uh comfortable and make them feel good uh so i can't tell you how many times i've been around women who will just ask a guy very nicely he'll work 12 hours straight for her and the next day a guy will ask that same guy where he'll work eight hours from and then uh, demand overtime 
So uh, ladies, there is an element to uh, construction where guys, honestly, uh, the good guys anyway, um, they, they, they enjoy being around women. So yeah. Um, Jeremy, let's keep it moving. You talked about something, you mentioned something earlier that uh, I wanted to touch on. You said in Toronto and in Canada, a master electrician is essentially, once they become a master electrician, they can become a business owner. This is obviously a financial channel. I'll talk about building generational wealth and financially emancipating yourself from poverty. So is that an ultimate goal of yours? Do you want to um, become a master electrician and own your own business? Is that a goal of yours or, or, or no? I haven't decided yet. Right now, I feel like uh, what my path is going to take me is to keep working and make my money work for me. So what I want to do is build a portfolio and get something going in that sense where it could perhaps generate as much money as a business itself would while so, still having a day a job. Financial portfolio. Financial portfolio, yeah, yeah. So the master electrician thing, uh, if you, let's say you're working, doing what I'm doing, working, building condos, and I have a master electrician license. That, it there is no difference on pretty much anything except the knowledge that I would have which may even be overqualified for what I'm doing. Um, in Canada, they changed the, the business rules to each business must have one master electrician. Could be the owner of the business or it could be someone who's hired. The same way but, in the States too, same way here too. Okay, yeah, so that's the, uh, that's basically the use of a, of a master electrician license. Uh, you gotta, you gotta basically uh, pay a fee every year for it as well. So, uh, I don't know. I don't know if uh, what what the future holds for me. If I if I'm if I'll pursue that route, uh, I'm thinking more along the route of uh, expanding my skill set as opposed to just having the the title of master electrician. The qualification as well would be nice having that option to open a business, but I just don't see it for myself yet. Want to become a better electrician like baseline electrician first so that means one of my co-workers is uh probably going to uh, autocad class right now as we speak at the union hall so learning autocad they have that opportunity uh learning welding that's another opportunity the fire alarm courses that's important Bro, I don't know if it's like this in Canada, but in America, we have no welders. So welders show up, say, this is what I want you to pay me, $225 an hour or else. We pay them two thirty. We pay them two twenty five. they work, and then they leave because there's no welders. So, if, Jeremy, if you can become a welder, bro, I'm telling you, if it's like it is in America, you'll get some serious uh, paper off of that. So, yeah, man, like all these things, too, it is skilled trade. So you got to be good at what you do. That's That's the main thing. No one's gonna pay two twenty five to someone who's well that has holes in it, right? <laughs> so you got to be good. That's the thing. Um, it's like uh, I guess in sports or whatever, the guy's got to be making his shots, right? So um, yeah, so all these there's all these courses to take at the Union Hall, and they got like state of the art facility. Uh, the Carpenters Union is um, nearby here, and man, that place people people rent rent that place out to have weddings and stuff and then it's like that nice wow they have like a banquet facility like a convention hall there classrooms uh it's, it's really good facilities man for all trades not just electricians like carpenters plumbers uh man everyone everyone is everyone in the trades is doing well up here in canada i'll say that yeah it's a blessing man uh, that's a blessing. Do you run across a lot of electricians that are like licensed welders as well? Is that like a big thing in Canada or? No, nah, that, that's usually on specific job sites. They'll just see if somebody has a welding uh, license gotcha. or welding certification. And uh, yeah, like unless they have a, a specific need to, they're, they're going to be welding a lot, then they'll hire a welder for sure. Gotcha. But uh, yeah, man, any uh, young guys looking at this channel, basically in high school if you start early enough like you could so with in my case i could have started this co-op or co-op or apprenticeship for um, since grade 10 and uh probably uh, would have beat the housing boom and uh been way more well off than i am right now like i'm pretty pretty doing all right right now but like you know hindsight's 2020 but damn man 
So if you start early trades, like you'll just be that much better and that much more prepared, man. It's really good. It's really good. Yeah, yeah. And you're too tired at the end of the day to do any mischief. If you're, you know, if you're trying to, if you're trying to stay out of trouble. It's a good way to stay out of trouble as well. You know, it's funny, man. I always tell all my, um, my OGs and like my little dudes and everything. These are the guys that kind of, let's just say, good people, but they made a couple mistakes here or there. I always tell them to kind of go the construction route, and I do that for two reasons. Like you said, most construction dudes that I know, um, I get up at three thirty every morning. I work out, then I go to work. Most construction guys that I know, they get up like you said around four four thirty. So then they get to work. They work really, really hard. They get home and they, they get off at 3.30 or 4 o'clock. They're sort of tired. So they chill, they boo with their girl. They go to sleep, wake up the next morning, the same thing. So yeah. you get into the trade. I always tell all my old, all my young dudes this, it keeps you out of trouble because you're going to bed so early. You ain't got time to kind of hang out with people that, are got, that got you in trouble in the first place. And then on top of that, because you're about your business and you're about your money, you kind of start seeing how much money you can make. I find it kind of takes guys out of stuff that they were doing to get money they should have been doing to begin with. So I always tell a lot of my dudes that basically, like I said, they're good, they're good guys, very entrepreneurial, very smart, but they made some mistakes along the way. If you can, get down with a good trade hall, get down with a good union hall, because you're going to get surrounded by guys who are going to kind of show you the way, and it's going to keep you out of a lot of trouble. And I always tell that to my dudes. I always tell that to them. Yep, yep. It's true, man. It's very true. And uh, I'll say women do like tradesmen. <laughs> like not not when you're not when you're uh like on the sitting on the curb eating your sandwich or whatever but like when you get when you have that handshake you know that strong grip and you know your your forearms is like looking all all jacked and stuff the girls look at it oh they like that they like that women love assertive dominant men that take care of our bodies and make a lot of money and when, when we do that they love us so we take i'm serious i'm telling like it is and we get educated and take care of our bodies and we got careers and we can basically protect provide and leave lead them they love that kind of stuff. I'm just telling it completely like it is. So, yep, you hit the nail on the head now, Jeremy. Yep. Yep, for sure, for sure. Also, too, uh, I'll, I'll big up my engineers as well. Um, if you do, uh, like I said, I started off in the engineering world. Uh, I still consider myself an engineer, by the way, even though um, I'm kind of in a, I'm more so on the field now. Um, but I still, I do engineering every day. I do calculations. I uh, basically help size ductwork. I help size gear. I do all that stuff. So I still use my analytical engineering brain. But one thing that I will also say about if you want to go the college route, construction is really good for the college educated dudes because generally speaking, most contractors pay a lot more than uh, quote unquote engineering firms. And on top of that, the best engineers I've ever met in my life, and this is one of the things that kind of got me to start thinking a little differently. The best engineers I've ever met in my life, they had real world experience working on construction sites. So right now, if you put me in a system and say, I need to explain how a cooling tower works or how a VAV box works or how a VFD box works or how low voltage versus high voltage, I can explain that 10 times better than any other engineer that's never been on the job site. Why? Because I'm physically seeing it every day in the MEP world. So I always tell engineers and even my college educated dudes, uh, don't look at construction on the management side or even learning a trade. Don't look at it as this thing that, okay, I shouldn't be doing that because I'm smart or I shouldn't be doing it because I'm white collar. No, bump that. Learn as much as you can. And I find that contractors, particularly my licensed electricians, my licensed sheet metal workers, my licensed um, fitters and everything, they know these systems better than any engineer that just drew it on paper. Why? Because they're the ones that are physically putting together. And if you really want to learn how to put a building together and how to build, literally walk around a job site, start observing how these people operate. And it's going to make you a vastly better engineer, a vastly better um, manager. And on top of that, it's also really going to help your people skills as well. So it's, it's one of those things. It helps you in so many different ways. Uh, we're coming to a close, Jeremy, so I want to ask you two, a few more questions, okay? Uh, you mentioned that you want your investment portfolio to be so good that you don't even necessarily have to work anymore unless you don't want to. So what is your investment strategy? Are you a crypto guy? Are you a real estate guy? Are you an index guy? Are you a mutual fund guy? What is what is Jeremy R's uh, portfolio uh, and investment kind of strategy, I would say, for all my listeners? So I had Wealth Simple for a bit, and I put a, little, a few dollars here and there into uh, different things like auto industry, some... Uh, different different things technology didn't see much growth in that just kind of tested poking around you know testing the waters right right and i uh, i was exposed to index funds someone told me index funds are good so now i, I kind of have it set up so they're instead of investing in lump sums i'm putting away as i would in the savings account into an index fund through my bank absolutely and uh that that's the only another another thing i was doing was uh 
life insurance, investing in a little bit of life insurance that uh, you could probably take out for a rainy day or something like that. Take out a lump sum. It kind of, I, I, I didn't really, I didn't really feel like that was, that was the best thing for me. So kind of drew, pulled out of that. And uh, yeah, got to keep going into the uh, index bonds. That's, that's my main strategy right now. Absolutely. I, I love it. If you watch my channel, um, I have a podcast up right now called How Index Funds Can Make You a Millionaire. I'm an index fund guy. Um, so I, I, I agree with that as well, Jeremy. I think there's so many. Uh, I like things that are simple, easy, effective and efficient. And I like index funds because they they are literally all three of that. The returns back to the stock market. Um, I love the uh, returns that I get with them and everything. I love the fact you can literally just fire, forget, put it in there and just let it grow. So I, I, I definitely feel you on that one. I definitely feel you on that one. And this is a good strategy. Anybody that's listening, watching this podcast, uh, as I said earlier, this is obviously a financial channel. So we talk a lot of uh, stuff about like just everything. But I will say this, uh, make, as mu- um, make a lot of money, save more, save as much money as possible and invest the difference. If you do that over the course of a 10 to 20 year period, you will become a millionaire. It's mathematically impossible not to. So, yep. So the three things I try to do is save for an emergency fund, yep. save for a big purchase, like you say a car or something something nice right right. save for something nice and the third thing i like to do is is save a lump sum for an investment if an investment opportunity arises not lump sum as in like put in a lump sum in an index fund but more like uh just i would just say auxiliary money let's say something hot comes about like nfts again i'll do it do something something crazy like that you know so, some something to uh something to play around with not not necessary I, so you said something recently too that was funny don't be boring with your money i like that one that one was fun you got to treat it like uh like a, like a woman ring. take it out do, do, move it around do different things with it so yeah. working on building up a lump sum of something to do that with that's what it's about. Like I, the, the analogy I was using is money is like a beautiful woman. If you have a beautiful woman, you only leave her at home. You don't take her anywhere nice. She's eventually going to leave you because you're a boring dude. Money is the same way. If you have a, a large, uh, a large uh, lump of money inside, like a boring bank that gives you an a, a interest rate of 0.01%, she eventually is going to leave you because you're boring for men named inflation and taxes. So as a result, you need to basically start putting that money into something that actually works for itself, like an exchange traded fund, an index fund, uh, Roth IRA, a 401k, a HSA, uh, a SEP IRA, things things like that. Your money uh, in America anyway, um, every year there's a certain percentage you can put into your Roth IRA, your 401k, and your health savings account. And those are all tax efficient accounts. And I will tell everybody, put as much money as you possibly can into those uh, three, uh, I call them pillars, into those three pillars. And if you do that and you invest in the right funds, and if, you, if somebody books a one-on-one with me, I can tell you what those funds should be. Uh, if you put your money into those funds, you are eventually going to be a millionaire much faster than you realize. Why? Because the money is just going to compound and compound and roll and roll. It's like a snowball that gets bigger as it goes down the hill. And that's the kind of way that you build your money. And like I said as well, Jeremy, have that rainy day fund. So if the housing market crashes, you can buy a house uh, for pennies on the dollar. Or if a very good investment comes around or a piece of land possible that you can purchase, uh, if you have that money saved up it's pretty, and it's liquid, you have that money that's available for you to buy that purchase. So there's so many different things you can do to uh, build generational wealth. And one thing, Jeremy, me and you have been kind of harping on in this podcast is that have a career that pays you a very good, hopefully six-figure salary or as much as possible, and then uh, take that salary and invest it properly so that you can essentially um, give your kids and your grandkids generational wealth. And that's that to me is what it's about. That's That to me is what it's about. So, yep. Uh, I have a quick question. Uh, are you aware of something called GICs? GICs, I am not. Maybe there's an American equivalent to it, but I am not. What is it? I'm learning about it myself too. It's uh, it's an investment. So right. it pays usually around 4 to 5% back. And uh, you just put your money in, let it sit there, and that's it. All right, cool, cool. I'm absolutely definitely a long-term investor, Jeremy. So I put my money in, I just let it grow for decades. It's kind of my thing. I don't purchase my stock, I don't sell it. And I generally try to do stuff that kind of matches the stock market, if you will. But I'll do some, I'll do more research on GICs. I have not, I'm not familiar with them. Um, with the 5% uh, return, I gotta see exactly what it goes into and what it matches and everything. But I, I'm not familiar with it, so I have to do more research on it, okay? So, yep. 
All right, we are coming to a close. Jeremy, so I have one more question I want to ask you, okay? And I thoroughly enjoyed this. Um, you are a brother, you are a son, you are an electrician, you're a cousin, and you're my friend. Uh, when it's all said and done, Jeremy, uh, and God calls you home, what do you want your legacy to be? Whoa. What do I want my legacy to be? Uh, I want to leave like a, maybe like a nice car for my kid or something, you know? Uh, something like that maybe like a, a little property or something that's a, that's about it Not, nothing too crazy make sure to let them know you know daddy worked on this and that that kind of thing i i haven't really put much thought into that yet but damn that's a heavy question man um yeah like wouldn't wouldn't want them to uh something like legacy to leave behind i mean we spoke about the uh working working on different different buildings and different projects that could be one thing that's pretty cool but material wise like actual like something tangible for them i don't know place to live roof over their head uh also Yeah, something like that, a nice car. Yeah, it's all good, man. The good thing about uh, the questions like that is that, take it from me, uh, I'm almost 40. Take it from me, uh, as you uh, age and everything, you're gonna be surprised at kind of how that legacy, it gets, you start to expand upon it and it gets bigger and bigger. The things that I wanted to accomplish at 20, when I accomplished them, I said, all right, cool, I wanna do this. The things that I wanted to accomplish in my late 20s, I accomplished them, I wanna do this. The things in my 30s and so forth. So that question is gonna continue to change and everything. Um, I know your mom, I know your sister, I know your cousins and everything. They're very proud of you, Jeremy. I thoroughly enjoyed just kind of watching the growth and the maturation over the years. And uh, keep, up right. the work, man. keep up the good work. Yep. And we are in somewhat similar industries, so don't be surprised if I reach out to you about some very technical electrical questions, okay? Oh, that would be funny. I hope I can answer them. <laughs> if you can't, you'll be able to point me in the right direction. Real talk, I actually reached out to, to my uh, to my some of my licensed master electricians more so than my electrical PEs just because... Um, sometimes the guys who do it in the field, they understand a lot better than the guy who actually drew it on a sheet of paper because it was copy and paste for the sheet of paper engineer. So yeah, it just, it is what it is. Sometimes you kind of have to uh, think outside the box to get an answer. So, yep. All right, cool. Jeremy, this has been a pleasure, man. I, I will tell this to everybody who's listening. Do not look at construction workers as dumb, uh, grungy guys or whatever who just did construction because they were stupid and they had to go into that row. I can't tell you how many morons I've met that honestly think that about uh, licensed contractors and do not think about it. Don't look at these guys as dumb. They are hardworking. They're extremely smart professionals, period. I've worked with some extremely Ivy League educated engineers that are idiots. I've worked with some uh, construction workers that never had a college degree and these guys know the systems better than the engineer ever did. Um, on top of that, the unemployment rates are very low in the blue collar world. The money is extremely good. The work life balance is actually a lot better than you think because like Jeremy said, you're getting home by four o'clock so you can get a, you can get a workout and you can cook your wife and your kids dinner. You can go to your soccer and your basketball games and watch your kids play. A lot of uh, six figure uh, lawyers, doctors and engineers, they don't get the chance to do that. And I've been on that world, so I know what that's like. So um, if college is not necessarily your thing or if college is your thing, you should definitely look at the trades. You should definitely look at trying to get some, to somehow involved in construction because the unemployment rates right now in America for licensed electricians, licensed carpenters, licensed sheet metal workers is literally less than 1.5%. Whereas the unemployment rate in America right now for uh, licensed professionals is about 4.5%. The salaries that you get as a contractor are generally speaking much better than they are for a person who went to college for four years and who has a degree. And another thing that I love about it as well, and Jeremy, you kind of touched on this. If you are a, um, a, a licensed uh, contractor, you are literally always employed because people always need somebody that's skilled labor. They always need somebody who knows how to work with their hands. So to my listeners, uh, like I said, if the Marine Corps isn't necessarily for you, if becoming a cop isn't necessarily for you, if college may or may not be a thing, honestly look to, honestly look toward the, uh, the trades and the union halls because it's an untapped market that they're literally begging people to um, go into. And just like Jeremy said, your salaries can literally start above $80,000 a year, easy. And you can easily double and triple that as the years go by. So Jeremy, I want to say thank you, bro, for uh, calling in. This has been a phenomenal podcast. I appreciate it, man. And next time I'm up in Toronto, I definitely will say what's up to you and your family. Everybody's up there because uh, I love your people. Y'all are some good people. So thank you, bro. I appreciate it. I appreciate the, uh, you calling in. All right, man. Enough love and respect. All the best to you and the fam.
Show for show. All right, everybody, this channel Financial Pace is all about making money. It's all about saving money. It's all about building generational wealth. And it's all about financially emancipating yourself from generational poverty. The book a one-on-one -on -one session with it. We can kind of go into a lot more details about some of the things that I talked about earlier in regards to like the health savings accounts, exchange traded funds, index funds, mutual fund investing, um, things of that nature. Uh, and in regards to trying to build, help you build your generational wealth, we're going to book a one-on-one -on -one session. You can follow me on Instagram at the real underscore financial patient, Spotify financial patient, just like it's spelled here on my hoodie, uh, TikTok financial patient, and my Facebook page is also financial patient. Um, and also, everybody check out my blog where I go into details about a lot more complicated financial aspects in regards to things that have worked for my family and myself in regards to helping us build our generational wealth. And uh, check out some of my digital e-products below as well, okay? Uh, please like, please comment, please share, please subscribe. Thank you, Jeremy. I'm definitely going to be visiting Toronto at some point. I don't know if I'm going to be going up there during the winter time because it's too friggin' cold. But during the summer, uh, a couple of your cousins have invited me, invited me and my wife to come back up. So we probably will at some point, okay? Well, yeah, we'd be glad to see you. Yeah, definitely. We got to do another, uh, do, do another one of those boat Caribbean parties. For sure, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right. No doubt, no doubt. I have my Trinidadian flag and everything. All right, everybody. Good, good. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Jeremy. It's your boy, Chris. I'm out. Peace. Peace. Ooh.